As I stand here, I'm somewhat reminded of my first football game when I was in the ninth grade. I was 175 pounds wet, and I stood before a huge halfback, and my coach expected me to tackle him. He was a guy by the name of Shanklin. He went to UT Martin at the time, and I was trying out. I had been all Midwest Conference and had uh, done a few things on the football field uh, eventually by the time I graduated. And I remember looking at this guy and thinking, you know, I'm going to tackle him. And he came on an end around on my tryout. I've jumped from ninth grade to tryout. And I was going to tackle him. And I said I would go to UT Martin and play football. Well, when I woke up, I went to Freed Hardeman. <laughs> I, I feel the same way this morning because I, I, I walked in and then I walked back out. I walked in and looked again and I walked back out. I said, this, just, this is so incredible. And I thank the Lord so much for giving me the privilege of standing here this morning amidst so many men that I admire so much who are gospel preachers, who have stood so well and so long uh, for those things that are true, those things that are right. And I thank God for the godly preachers and evangelists and elders and deacons and missionaries and teachers in this room today who are making a statement for the world to see that the report of our demise was very premature that we are just as strong and that we will continue to be strong and that we will continue to stand for those things that are right, regardless of what some people seem to think we ought to do on this time in history. So I thank God for you. You encourage me, invigorate me. When I came here last year, my wife was sick. She had just had a stroke. You prayed for me. I lost her on the 8th of September last year. It was like part of me had left. I stood there in the hospital room watching her, all hooked up to different things there, and I was watching my bride that I met at Freed Hardeman, and the beautiful girl that had been with me for 45 years, and I was, my, my daughters were talking, saying, Daddy, you need to go on and preach and get out of this room. You've been in this room nonstop now for almost a month. And I said, I, I, can't, I can't go. And they said, Daddy, you need to go on and preach. If you get in the car now, you can drive all night and be there in time to preach the next morning. Well, I, I protested. And then my wife, who I did not think was looking, she turned and gave me a look that I recognized very well because I'd seen that look so many times for 45 years. And that look said, if you don't get in that car and go preach, I'm going to get out of this bed and get you. Well, I drove all night and I got here just in time to change clothes and come to the pulpit. And the outpouring of love and concern and prayers pulled us through and the cards that came from all over the country. I just wanted to take this moment to thank you. Thank you so much for being my brothers and my sisters in a time of need and being there for my family. I thank you so much. Christians, my brothers and sisters, Jesus stated in the book of Matthew's gospel, chapter 18, somewhere around verses 20, when he was speaking to his disciples in a time much like the time that we live today, in a time where our brothers and sisters were suffering, where the Lord was making a preparation to pay the price of our redemption. When he spoke to his children, when he spoke to his disciples, he made a statement there that I want us to take to heart as I go into the lesson today. The Lord said, where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. And our omnipresent, crucified, risen Lord wants every one of us to understand that this this morning, that there is only one spectator in this room. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. One spectator. There's only one person worthy of being praised, worthy of reverence, worthy of worship. His name is Jesus. 
All of us that are in this room this morning, we are participating in something we have been given the privilege to do, and that is to worship, to worship God and worship him in such a way that we show him the sincere sentiments of our hearts, that we are thankful for what he has done for us and for what he has given us. All of us participants must take to heart what Jesus said to the Samaritan woman at the well. In the book of John chapter four and verses 24, when our Lord said very clearly to this woman who was pointing at a mountain and was pointing at a symbol and at a tradition, that the Lord wanted her to know that the world will soon change because I'm going to look at your heart, your sincerity. I'm going to look to see whether or not you are real. And those things that you say, that you sing, that you preach, that you teach, that they are truly from within you and they are truly what you feel and believe. So therefore, Jesus said, God to this woman, God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. On this occasion, Jesus in red letter law, as my daddy used to say, he let them know on that occasion, let this woman know that the hour cometh or the time is, the time is when the Lord wanted us to know that the true worshipers shall worship the father in spirit and in tr and truth for the father seeketh such to worship him. This is a time when God wants to be worshiped in spirit. He wants to be worshiped in truth. He don't need the platitudes and the ritual and the ceremony that we see played out in front of us every day. But what God wants are those who truly love him. One time when the prophet went to the house of Jesse to find a replacement for Saul who had broken God's heart with transgression, trying to offer God something that he did not ask for and most certainly something that he could not accept. And the prophet wanted him to know that obedience, obedience is better than sacrifice. And as he looked around this man's house for a replacement, he looked at all of Jesse's fine looking boys and every one of those boys to the old prophet looked kingly and stately and they would look good in the finery of Israel and riding in a chariot with their hair blowing in the wind. But God said about each one of them, I reject them. I don't want them. I don't want him. I don't want him. I reject him. And don't you know the old prophet somehow does what we do from time to time? When we think we know better than God and we understand the marketplace and what's going on around us better than God, he wanted to know what's wrong with them. And God let him know after he has asked Jesse, do you have any other boys? And he says, yes, I've got one more boy. He's out here watching the sheep and playing his harp. He goes up and God said, that's the one. That's the one I want. Don't look upon this ruddy appearance. Don't look at the things that you think are important. But instead, God says, while you look on the outward appearance, I look at the heart. And I believe that as God comes down, our Savior comes and visits this room on this beautiful Sunday morning that we've been given the privilege on this first day of the week to come together to serve him and worship him and the beautiful singing got to be the most beautiful sound this side of heaven that has happened in this room this morning. I believe that my God and my Father is doing the same thing he did then, that he's looking at our hearts and he knows that we need him so much in the time in which we live that there are those of us in this room who are saying, Abba Father, Abba Father, I need thee, I need thee, oh, I need thee. We're here not because we have succeeded so much in life, we have gained so much or accomplished so much. We're not here because we're great and we are so smart and intelligent and intuitive, but we're here because we know that we need the Lord and we need him to take care of us in our time in history. This is our time. This is our time. This is the time when we've got to find an inward strength that we've got to examine ourselves in every fiber of our being, where we've got to do an introspective examination of ourselves, that we've got to be sure about our identity 
our mission, our message, and the methodology that has been given to us by the Scripture. This is our time when we stand unified just as the church did in the first century. In Acts chapter 2, when all that believed were together, that's who we are, that's what we are, and that's what we must be in a world that's splintered with false doctrine and false ways and false prophets and false moralities. This is our time to show the difference between the holy and the profane. The world is attempting to expel God from the marketplace, to expel him from the hearts of men, to expel him from the eyes of our children, to put him out of our homes, out of our politics, to do everything possible to make the voice of Christians mute in a time when evil and degradation and perversion and corruption gets louder and louder and more profane and profane. This is our time when we go back and we notice something because I need you to remember as I had to remember in making this study that when we think about the scriptures, this wonderful book, which is a letter from home, that it contains one thing, one story, the greatest story ever told about the greatest life ever lived. And that is about my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. All 66 individual letters from different men across the world at different times as holy men of God spake, as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, they all tell one story, how God planned, executed, and revealed the salvation of fallen man, how God created redemptive religion, and why God decided to do it. It couldn't have come from a better source than Jesus Christ himself, who himself out of his own mouth gave us the reason of the privilege we have this morning when Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He said, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might have life. There in John chapter 3, 16 and 17, often called the golden text of the Bible, we see the heart of God revealed in that word so love, an adverb of degree. God so loved us that Jesus, the best gift that could be given from heaven, came to execute the plan. God in the first messianic prophecy there in Genesis chapter three, after man has broken his heart, listened to his enemy, fallen down, done what was wrong, God decided to save man and makes it clear there in Genesis three that he's going to save man. If God's gonna die in man's place, somebody has to do the dying and the historical record in the scriptures show us how God brought forth a redemptive religion. When we look at this, we're thinking about the history of those that, who, who God sought to save and those who God used in our salvation. The scriptures record the great men and the great women that were used by God at various places and times, the types of which we have the antitypes, as God created spiritual nomenclature, advanced a bloodline, established a priesthood so that he could save mankind and the Messiah, the one sent, could be clearly recognized by everybody that needed his blood in order to have their salvation. Each of these people, when we look at the Hebrew letter, every one of them had their time, their moment in history to stand in, in front of God as obedient vessels to use for the purpose of God. That said, the Hebrew letter is a great document for us in our time, in our time, because here we see the history and learn and are encouraged by the behavior of those who stood in their time in history. 
The Hebrew writer respectfully refers to all of these heroes of the faith, and he reminds us that the Bible is a complete journal of how they stood in difficult times and how they obeyed God. From the beginning of the Bible, we see that this is what God has given and God has placed it before our eyes. And we remember what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 15 and verses four, when Paul said clearly, for whatsoever was written aforetime was written for our learning, that we through patience or perseverance and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Don't you know in the time in which we live, there are days that I'm frustrated. There are days that I'm disgusted. There are days that I'm disappointed. Sometimes I watch the news and I can't help but cry. There are days when I think about my grandchildren. There are days I think about my children and the young folks of the church. My goodness, my brothers and sisters, I don't want to see the time my grandchildren are going to have to grow up in if we don't stand in this hour time in history and change some things that absolutely have to be changed. I don't want to see the world my babies are going to have to live in and the things they're going to have to see. I would rather God take me away from here than if we refuse to stand in this hour time in history and fight the battles that have been laid to our charge. The Hebrew letter helps us unlock the history of those individuals where at least 35 times the author refers to the characters that are within the Old Testament and we see them in their time in history. And Jesus, therefore, as he reveals, Jesus is the author of our salvation. Jesus is superior even before his incarnation. And at his birth, Jesus is initiated a time, it initiates in a time that will be concluded at his return. The Hebrew writer says, God who at sundry times in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, and by whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of power, when he had by himself purged or cleansed our sins, sat down on the right hand of majesty on high. What a beautiful way to begin a book. Because in that beginning, he says that God had spoken by dreams and poetry and miracles and other ways. But he speaks to us in this day by his son. And therefore, in Hebrew chapter 2 and verses 1, to those of us who are living in this particular time in history, he says, therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, unless at any time we should let them slip or we should let them drift away. What the world wants us to do is allow what we have learned from these men and women in the book of Hebrew in Faith's Hall of Fame is to allow it to drift away and make it irrelevant to what's happening to us today. They don't want us to go back and see these wonderful men and women within this letter because the letter was most likely written to our brethren who at that time were under persecution. From the Greek manuscripts, it addressed simply to the Hebrews, believe written somewhere around 63 or 64. The Jewish Christians were ready for apostasy. So the book made them aware of some things that they had to remember and some things that we need to remember. The history of their redemption, the history of their redeemer, the history of those who were faithful to God's plan. Make them aware that this was their time in history and each of them persevered. In Hebrew chapter 2, verses 9, 
The writer said, but we see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. What a wonderful statement that Jesus looked down upon mankind. Jesus, who was there in the beginning, Jesus, the Son of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Godhead where God the Father plans all, God the Son executes all, and the God the Holy Spirit beautifies or brings order out of chaos. Where Jesus saw man when he disobeyed God, broke God's heart, but still decided to die for us. My brothers and sisters, that's a wonderful statement that he decided to taste death for every man because we realize that God had said to Mother Eve and Father Adam that if you take of this tree, you shall surely die. And God the promise maker is God the promise keeper. So God, according to Paul in Philippians chapter two and verses nine, highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name. So the Hebrew writer, as I read this wonderful book, this writer emphatically states that those who at that particular time were wavering, waffling, indifferent, uncommitted, those brethren who were ready to abandon their personal sacrifice, that they need to go back and look at these brethren and sisters, these men and women in Faith's Hall of Fame and find their faith again. In our time in history, there are some of us who need to find our legs, our backbone, open our eyes, find our faith, lift our head, and not be beaten down by those who want to call us narrow-minded and backwards that we're on the wrong side of history, that we're still following this old Bronze Age book, that our religion is antique, irrelevant, and unimportant to mankind, and that the only thing important is technology and growth and prosperity instead of raising our children, keeping our families, and strengthening our souls. So he says, now faith, is the substance or the realization of reality. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. The elders stood with God. The elders were unflinching. And this is what the Hebrew writer brings out about their time and their time in history. He goes on to say, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For they that come unto the Father must, 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 must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. To these faithless brothers and sisters, the writer reminds them of the faithful. Each had an active and obedient faith. Each one of them stood and their faith was a work that they were willing to carry out because James said in James 2 that faith without works is dead. And how many of us today want to make a claim? Oh, I believe in the Lord. I believe in the church. I believe in the scriptures. I believe in gospel preaching. I believe in saving the world. I believe in raising my children. But how many of us today, that belief is becoming shallow and it is becoming empty. As some of us seem to substitute church going for Christianity and activity for productivity. In essence, what we have to do is get back and realize that in our time in history, as I say, everywhere I go, we don't have the luxury anymore of sitting down on the seat of do nothing and lean back on the elbows of do less and say, wake me up when we all get to heaven. We don't have that luxury anymore. Now we've got to stand. We've got to stand. We've got to stand. We've got to look the devil in his old ugly eye. We've got to let him know we're not going another further. 
that we're going to draw the line in the sand. We've got to let him know that in this our time in history, we're going to learn from those that God has placed before us. They had activity and so was, must we. The Bible says in the Hebrew letter, Abel offered. What are you offering? Enoch pleased God. Are you pleasing God? Noah prepared an ark. Are you preparing a place of safety? And he goes on to let us know, even in Genesis chapter 6, that Noah was a great man in his generation, in his time. God's not asking you for perfection. He knows that there was only one perfect life lived. Jesus Christ is the only one that we can say who knew no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. All of us are recovering sinners. That's why the Apostle Paul said in Romans 3 and 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I don't know about you, but there are many days I look me in the mirror and I look me in the eye and I know that I have come short of giving God glory for what God has given me. It is on those days that I almost have to fall to my knees right then and ask God to forgive me, to be patient with me, to be long suffering with me and give me an opportunity, Father, to stand the way you want me to and to fight the way you want me to and to speak the way you want me to. At this particular time in history, Abraham offered Isaac. Abraham obeyed and sojourned. Are you offering your children who are God's heritage? Sarah conceived seed. Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph. Joseph gave commandment concerning his bones. Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Are we making up our minds in this hour time in history that we're going to step back from those who want to bribe us and threaten us with those things that are in the world that they can take away from us Unless we stand and believe and lay down our faith and walk away from our Lord, are we going to be threatened in this fashion? The Apostle Paul said to each of us in his time, as he spoke to the brethren, wanting Titus to take this word to everybody he could get it to. Titus, Paul to Titus and Titus 2 11 and 12, Paul said, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, all men, all men, all men. Everybody has access to this salvation that the Lord provided, has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. Paul is saying, don't sell out. This is your time in history. You show the difference between the holy and the profane. You let them know that there is nothing on this earth that is worthy of losing your soul. You let them know that there is nobody that you love more than Jesus Christ, your savior. He said, you be sober, responsibility to yourself, righteous, responsibility to your brothers, godly, responsibility to your creator in this present world. What the Lord is saying is you're the light of the world. It's you. It's you. You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. If I smell the stench of sin and perversion and corruption, immorality, if I see apostasy and false doctrine and false ways and false teachers, don't you know wherever there's a false teacher, there's a false teaching? Wherever there's a false prophet, there's a false prophecy. Wherever there's a false leader, there's a false way. Don't you know that the Lord is watching as millions? He's already conceded the numbers. He, he's conceded the numbers because the Lord said out of his own mouth, the narrow way few there be that find it. 
the broad way many there are that go in there at. So he's conceded the numbers. What he's saying to you is, I want to see you fight. I want to see you stand. I want to see you persevere. I want to see you endure. I want to see you speak out. I want to see you run. I want to see you act like warriors. I want to see you militant. I want to see you unafraid. And as long as I see two or three of you gathered together in my name, I'm in your midst. I will fight for you. That's why I fight so hard. I'm not worrying about those who will tell me to the face that they don't believe in God. The Bible has said the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So I know I'm talking to a fool. When they come and tell me they don't believe, I know when I'm talking, I'm talking to a fool and I get away from you just as fast as I can. I don't spend a lot of time talking to fools, but I want you to understand this. God said, when you fight, when you stand, when you speak, I'll fight with you. We're going to save this nation, this world, this country, this community for our grandchildren. The devil don't have a right to it and we're not going to concede it, but we're going to stand as God told us to. So our children and our grandchildren can have the same type of life that we had. So what does the Hebrew writer tell the brethren who are ready for apostasy? Why is he bringing up Moses and Jacob and Sarah and David and Barak and Samson and so many others? You know why? He says in, ch in chapter 12, verses 1, Wherefore seeing we also are compressed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. He said, how are you going to look at Moses and this great cloud of witnesses that look down, if you don't mind me metaphorically saying it this morning, that are looking down on this audience. How are we going to tell them that God requires everything of them, but nothing of us? How am I going to put the Apostle Paul's head on Nero's chopping block? Where this man walks saying, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give in that day, not to me only, not to me only, not to me only, but all of them that love his appearance, how am I going to put that good man, my brother Paul, my brother Paul, how am I going to put his head on Nero's chopping block and then tell myself that I don't have to make the sacrifice myself just because it gets hard that I have a right to walk away, to not stand because I might lose something economically or professionally or financially. I can't put that man's head on that chopping block and still walk away and think that God's going to let me in the same heaven he's going to have Paul come in. How in the world am I going to put Stephen before those Jews that when he stood there and gave succinctly the scheme of redemption from the beginning to this boy Jesus, this young man Jesus, on the middle cross, on a garbage heap on the outside of Jerusalem. How in the world am I going to have this man stand there and preach, preach, preach without flinching, without changing, without altering, and do it with courage? How am I going to have this man stand there and preach? And the Bible said they were cut to the heart in Acts chapter 7. And they began to chew on him and gnash on him and scratch him and drug him outside the city where they could do it privately without the eyes of a lot of people and stone that good man to death for doing nothing other than preaching the truth. How in the world am I going to step back from preaching? But I'm going to put Stephen in the, in the face of those devils who took his life. How am I going to have a sword going in James' belly and coming out of his back? How am I going to have Christians impaled on posts, covered with tar, and lit a fire while they're still alive to light the streets of Rome? How am I going to put families in the Colosseum with all types of wild, ravenous, half-starving animals eating them alive and tell myself 
that all I've got to do is show up every now and then and, you know, do a little bit here and there. And that's all I've got to do. This is your time in history. This is your time in history. This is your time. They stood in their time. They fought in their time. They suffered in their time. They died in their time. They gave up everything in their time. This is our time in history to do what God wants us to do. The writer says, lay aside every weight. The apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter three and verses two, he said, set your affections, set your affections, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. And then he said, but now ye also put off these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filter communication out of your mouth and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And that's just what Paul is saying is put off the stuff that's holding you back. My grandpa, I told you last year, you may remember me saying this, but my grandpa, we called him Papa Stalin and Papa Stalin had old bulldog. An old bulldog was a huge animal. This thing, when he stood up, he was taller than all of us children. But Papa Stein had built a beautiful Taj Mahal doghouse, but he kept that dog on the chain because that was a huge dog. And that dog, over a period of years, he had run around that doghouse so many times because we would go to the dog. We knew the doghouse was right here and the dog stopped right there. And as kids, we were stupid. We, we were stupid. You know, we go to the dog and we mess with the dog because we know the dog could go no further than the chain. He could only go as far as the chain allowed him. And over a period of years before that dog died, we learned to respect that dog because the dog let us know when there were intruders as we grew older. But he had dug a trench around that dog house because he could go no further than the chain allowed him to go because he was staked into the ground. Don't you realize that Christians in our time in history, that we got to go pull up the stakes that are keeping us from making the sacrifices we ought to make and doing the things we ought to do? Don't you know that Jesus said that for every one of us that we've got to pick up our cross and follow him? And if you look at that word cross in the Greek, it means a stake. What's holding you back? What's keeping you from telling folks about your faith? What's keeping you from telling people that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? What's keeping you from telling them that you believe that the Bible is the inspired word of God, that holy men spake as they were moved, that the word of God is inspired and is profitable for so many things that strengthen our soul? What's keeping you from raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? What's keeping you from letting the people around you who work with you know that I am different? I'm different. I'm different. I'm a child of God. If you want to know about the Lord, I can tell you about the Lord. The apostle Paul said to our brethren in Ephesians chapter four and verses 22, you know what Paul said to them? Paul said that you put off concerning the former conversation, your old behavior, what you used to be and used to do. Sometimes I say it at, at, at home, so pardon me for saying this. I, I told one old dude, man, oh, one old dude was, he was all oh, man back in the 70s, man, you should have saw me in the 70s. Oh man, my afro was this. Oh, I had a red suit, a pink suit, a white suit. I had all, he's going on and on. I said, you know what's wrong with you, brother? He said, what, Brother D. Barry? I said, you miss it too much. He looked at me real funny because he didn't realize what he was saying. He didn't abhor the sinner that he used to be. He didn't regret the things he used to do. He wasn't glad that he had made a change. He's looking at those days as his old heroic days when he was somebody. Now he's just a Christian, just a church member, just a follower of Jesus. And don't you know that's the way a whole lot of people are about the changes they make in life? They don't abhor the sin. They don't hate what they used to be. There are too many who really regret that they found Jesus. There are some people I say, they'll always be Christians, but they'll never be happy about it. 
And what we got to do is be happy about being children of God because thank God you let us live. You were long suffering when we were stupid. You let us keep living when we were acting crazy. You look past our faults and you saw our needs and you let us find what was true. And I thank God for that so much that he has been so good uh, to us. My brothers and my sisters, Paul said, therefore, let me tell you about your times. This know also, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verses 1. This know also that in the last days or the last times, peerless times shall come. Paul goes in verses two through verses four through a catalog of abomination, a catalog of behaviors that accurately describe our time in history. Then in verses five, he gives a conclusion that speaks very well about most of the religionists in America today. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. I remember Jesus saying to a group of religious leaders one time, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. It's your job to let them know the manifold wisdom of the church of God has to be revealed by the church because it is our time in history. Paul went on to say in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 3, as all of you can quote, for the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heed to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables, 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 lies, untruths, false prophets, false Bibles, false ways. Oh yes, God made me this way. Oh no, you shouldn't force religion upon your children. Oh no, you can't tell me that I'm a man when I know that I'm a woman. I've heard all these things, these false ways and false philosophies that are supported, unfortunately, by decisions of our Supreme Court. Therefore, this is our time. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. If we don't preach it, who's gonna preach it? If we don't teach it, who's gonna teach it? If we don't stand, who's gonna stand? You're the church. You're the last man standing. You're the last man standing. Everybody else have already sold out. All the other major religions are already rewriting their doctrines and their dogmas and their catechisms. You're the last man standing and the devil wants you out of business. And for this reason, every one of us need to understand this is our time. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits or, uh, and, and the doctrines of devils, demonic teaching. Paul says that we are going to find out that evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What must we do? Stand. What must we do? Stand. What do we do? Stand. Why? It's our time in history. Just as those in Hebrew 11 stood, it's our time to stand. The Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul says, you're not wrestling against the people out in the marketplace. That man wearing a dress, that woman wearing a mustache, that's not your enemy. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers against the rulers of darkness of this world. And we know who they are, don't we? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. So what did he tell us to do? Put your armor on. Put your armor on. The Roman Empire failed because its soldiers said that the armor was too heavy. 
They had a shield that was almost six feet tall that they dipped in water because it was covered in, in hide. And they worked out every day to be strong enough to hold up that shield. And when the Roman soldiers put those shields together, it was an impenetrable wall. But they said the shield was too heavy and they laid it down and got a little round shield. They said the helmet was too heavy because it protected too much of their head. They didn't have any mobility and they couldn't get around very good. So they took the helmet off and put on a little cap. They said the sword, the, the fabled two-edged sword that Paul talked about, they said this sword is too heavy, it's too big because many of the Roman soldiers were going home and sending their conscripts in their place in the draft. So they reduced the sword to a dagger. But guess what? While the Romans were undressing, their enemies were redressing. While the Romans were laying down their big armor, their enemy was copying their armor. While the Romans were taking off their helmet, taking off their breastplate, removing their feet guards, taking off that fam famous sandal that had spikes in it, their enemy had already copied it and their enemy came and destroyed them. The devil wants to destroy us from within. He wants to destroy us from within. This is why the apostle Paul told the brethren that after his departure, grievous wolves shall enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And Paul said, of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. But you know what Paul said? Therefore, I endure all things for the elect or the saved, that they may also obtain the salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 10. So my brothers and my sisters, I want you to know something. Peter realized that his days were short. He was heading toward martyrdom. He knew he was going to die. The Lord had told him he was going to die. As a matter of fact, the Lord told him that the only one who would not be martyred was John. Peter didn't appreciate that a whole lot, but he knew it was going to happen because the Lord said it. So here is what Peter said to your brethren 2,000 years ago. And here is what Peter says to you on this day in your particular time in history. He said, beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice, but rejoice, but rejoice in so much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you be reproached, he continued, or insulted, if you be maligned and talked about for the name of Christ, he said, happy are you when they come after you because of your stand. Thank God that they can see I'm different. When they come after your children because they can see that they've been raised right, you thank God that they can see the difference. When they come after your husband because he's a man like Joshua who stood before the children of Israel and said, if it seem evil for you to serve the Lord, choose, choose. Choose you this day who you will serve. But this man stood before the people and he said emphatically, and he said with strength, as for me and my house, my house, every man in this room ought to be able to say it. As for me and my house, my house, we will serve the Lord. Problem with too many of us is we haven't chosen sides yet. You gotta choose sides. You got to decide as Moses asked the people who's on the Lord's side. As for me and my house, when folks see your wife and they talk about her, you thank God that they can see that she's not like the rest of them. When people talk about the way you run your house, you thank God that they can see that the devil don't run your house and he hasn't got a spare room in your house. You thank God that they can see the difference. This is what he says, you be happy. Jesus said it like this, blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you 
and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Jesus said, when folks talk about you, you be glad that they talk about you. I don't know what time I'm supposed to talk, stop talking. <laughs> I guess somebody's gonna give me some cues, right? <laughs> Go. <ahead. laughs> Paul said to the brethren, oh my goodness, stop. Okay. <laughs> Let me, let me say this before I stop. <laughs> the apostle Paul said to the brother, the Hebrew writer said to the brethren, don't y'all get it that this is a time you should be ready. We've been telling you about this and telling you about this. In Hebrew chapter five and verses 12, he said, when time when you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. You have need of milk and not meat. Too many of us are perpetual new converts. We just keep living our first year over and over. We've been in church 20 years, but we've been living our first year over and over and over. I want to remind you of something. This is our time. Let's make sure that our children know, know and understand what we are and who we are. Stop trying so hard to give your children what you didn't have that you forget to give them what you did have. You got to give them what you did have. We were brought up in the nurture and admonition. We were taught right. My mama had a switch that would turn corners. <laughs> she made sure that we understood and that we worship. I was never asked if I felt like going to church. Children are about 25% of the population but they are 100% of the future. They're our ambassadors that we send to a time that we will not see. So we've got to stand now, this our time in history, if they're going to see a world that's worth living in, we've got to fight now. Our Savior stood for us. He did not give up. They put him on a scourging post and they tried to kill him on the scourging post because KP duty, as we used to call it, was going up on that hill with those rotting bodies and the buzzards and the wolves. So they wanted Jesus to die, but he wouldn't die. He wouldn't die. He took that beating 39 times. He took that beating 39 times. He took the lash. He took the whip with the hooks pulling out clugs of flesh from his body. He stood, they blindfolded him. They snapped him upside his face. But he stood there. They tied his hands and they spit in his face. He couldn't even remove the spittle that was going toward his face. They laid him on a cross after taking him from judgment hall to judgment hall. My Lord and my Savior, he could have, when he prayed three times, the scariest prayer that has ever been prayed. Scariest prayer. Father, is there another way? I've done everything you told me to do. Is there another way? Jesus prayed this scary prayer because if God had brought Jesus home, there is no plan B. If Jesus don't get on that cross, we don't have any salvation. And Jesus laid on that cross and they nailed him with nails in his hands. They nailed him with nails in his feet and they hung him between the twilights of two worlds, between two thieves. He took care of his mama. He took care of a fellow sufferer. Jesus did this for you and me. We've got to hear this. We've got to hear this. We've got to believe this with all of our hearts. We've got to repent of our sins, make a decision. I'm going to follow you, Lord. We've got to acknowledge his lordship. You're the Lord. And when I tell my old man, I'm not feeding you anymore because we're the spiritual man and the physical man. The one you feed will live. The one you starve will die. I tell that physical man, that carnal man, that worldly man, that materialistic man, that sinful man, I will not feed you another day. And he falls down. Paul said, mortified, I pick his old ugly self up and I bury him in a watery grave. Don't you know that God in his power and wisdom decided that I go to a watery grave when I get in that water, I can't breathe on the water. Jesus was dead. He didn't breathe for three days. I go down on that water. I got to hold my breath. It's like mimicking death. 
And then I come out of that water and I take my first breath as a new creature, as a new soul, as somebody with a new birthday, just like Jesus opened his eyes on the third day and took his breath with all power in heaven and earth. I come out of that water and I take my first breath as a child of God. And if I fall away, God still loves me. He still loves me. That's why Jesus gave the parable of the prodigal. Come home, come home, come home, come home, come home, come home. He's waiting for you. He loves you. Ask for his forgiveness. He'll forgive you every time, every time, every time. Think about it.